Welcome everybody to Indiana. Today we're doing a video on the USDA hardiness maps from inside of my chicken run, which is actually really awesome. Um, if it gets too cold out, I might have to move inside of the chicken coop, but that's, I think we'll be all right. So what the USDA has come out with, they, over the last 30 years, they've been collecting data and from like 13,000 different weather stations. And what they've done is they've updated all the hardiness zone maps for North America. Um, my zone actually went from a 5B to a 6A, but that really doesn't affect what I plant or how I plant or anything like that. And there's actually two major like structural problems to this map that I wanted to cover because it can create like a, a really large problem for me or any of your plantings. Now the, the map itself is great. It's a great you know rule of thumb. It's a great thing to check on plant tags to make sure you're in the right zone area. But there's a reason why um, we try not to plant out of zone too often unless we have a really good microclimate or like in the case of citrus trees we keep them in pots and we bring them in in the winter or if we have a greenhouse to extend our zone um, it's because of these two major inherent problems actually in the hardiness map that i wanted to cover real quick first problem is because the hardiness zone map is actually based off of average annual extreme minimum temperature and i wrote that down so i wouldn't forget so this means that over the past 30 years they've taken the lowest temperature of the winter and then averaged it um, throughout all of these half mile zones because the new map is accurate to within a half mile block on each side each you know half mile square and that temperature has been averaged over the past 30 years compared to across the street which is the next half mile block so this may not sound like too big of a problem, but it's the extremes which I'm worried about. I'm extreme, worried about extremes in rainfall, in the lack of rainfall, extremes in temperature, extremes in heat. And this has to do with outliers. So the second main problem with this map is the removal of outliers. Now outliers in statistical analysis are often removed because they can be one off. So they can, you know, they can skew the averages by too much that it, it, it actually hurts the end result in such a way that they need to remove them. Uh, they can compare, of course, they can compare and contrast and be like, okay, well, we're gonna leave the outliers in. But if you have a data set of, you know, seven through 12, and you have one of those as a one, you might get rid of the one because it's six removed from the lowest other, you know, the next numbers, there's a factor of six in between. So it, sometimes it doesn't make sense to keep the outliers in. But like I said, that's what I'm concerned about is the outlier. So I've linked actually to a great video by Gardner Scott, and I've really liked his videos over the years, but he goes into more detail. He actually worked on this project, this mapping project for the USDA in Colorado. Now his zone didn't change, but he actually goes into some of the, some of the removal of the outliers, and he had a couple of examples where they actually changed. There was a spot where there was two squares almost next to each other that were extremely hot and extremely cold. So instead of adjusting the whole region, they just removed those data sets. Isn't so important to the other areas in that region, but for those specific microclimates or those specific areas, it's very important because if it's an annual temperature of 10 degrees colder in that one half mile block, it's really important to know that because that's a whole zone. 10 degrees are the is the range in which the zones are created. So it's very important to keep an eye out for those. Now specifically this fast fall, we had 10 days of negative 30 degree weather. With the wind chill, it got down to like negative 36 for 10 days. I was trying to raise chickens in my garage. We had heat lamps going, all sorts of things. Now I didn't lose any plants that I know of. And that's actually what concerns me is, is this, did this last year, did that outlying temperature range or temperature minimum extreme did that get removed and that's why my region was actually upgraded from 5b to 6a if that data set I and mean, i couldn't find out if that data set had been removed however i'm going to remember that my area my yard my land my half acre can experience negative 30 degree weather for stretches of a week or more so i can offset some of these things obviously if it's planted and the soil is heavily mulched if you have wind breaks, if you have a you know a wall of pines like I do, things like that, if you have these protections, it actually creates what's called a microclimate. And microclimates allow you to, you know, move a move a zone down or a zone up depending on. Same as 
if you are planting things in a greenhouse, you can actually grow in Indiana, you can grow vegetables throughout the year if you have a good greenhouse. Another good example is you can hear the chickens behind me squawking up a storm. The this actual this this chicken coop is a kind of an example of a microclimate. So it, it is planted under a mulberry tree. So it leaves out later in the spring and it provides shade in during the hot summer months to this chicken coop where I want it to stay cool. But it's it, it loses its leaves in the fall so that the winter sun can keep it warm in the winter when I need it to be warmer. Uh, another example is just determining which type of shade a full sun plant gets. So we have a couple of pawpaws. We planted them on the south side of a couple of trees that can provide shade in the evening. So those pawpaws, they get morning sun, which is less harsh than the evening sun. So that in their, you know, since they're just saplings, they can get enough solar energy, but they won't be blasted by the extremes of the day which is what we're concerned about is the extreme. If it's an average, like Guam has an average temperature of 82 degrees throughout the year, but they have days where it gets to 60. And on those days that it's 60, you're gonna want a sweater and a hat. An average number is great and it gives you an idea, ballpark figure, but it's not the end all be all. So I plant mostly perennials and I usually allow for zonal errors and anomalies and things like that. So this is really critical for me because if I was just doing annual plants, I would just you know, prepare the soil and wait for the spring. Um, however, I really need my cherry trees and my, and my berry bushes, my hascap bushes, all that stuff to make it through the winter. I don't want to have, let's say, like the, my blueberry plants, which die back every winter, grow through the summer, never put on fruit, and then they die back in the winter. Um, what I want is for them to progressively grow, survive the winter, and grow again in the spring. I want to be pruning in the spring, not waiting for a new plant to shoot up from the roots. So I really appreciate that the USDA has updated their map because it makes it much more detailed. However, there's, you know, just like in any sort of product, there can be errors and it's not that they're mistakes or that there's anything wrong with them. It's just that we need to know how the data was tabulated, how it was combined, how it was averaged and all these other things. So thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. All right, bye-bye. Cute boy. <laughs> All right, Jickies, I, I'm done messing with you. You guys having fun out here? Okay, say bye-bye now. Bye-bye.